Okay, we are in uh, chapter 9, and we're going to hit head on the conversion of this radical uh, persecutor of the church by the name of Saul. And so uh, in chapter 1, of course, we had uh, the early marching orders, the appointment of uh, Matthias and the Pentecost, the lame man healed, so forth. And we went through chapters 6, and we just finished a few sessions ago uh, uh, Stephen's incredible survey of the, of the Old Testament. And then last time, we explored chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian treasure, just to give you a perspective here. So now we are finishing up unit 1. We have just four chapters left. And uh, we're going to take chapters 9 and 10 tonight and uh, deal with uh, some remarkable events in both of these, uh, including the uh, Tabitha being raised from the dead and, of course, Cornelius and this incredible vision of Peter that also changes the whole picture here. When the persecution broke out in Jerusalem, the church, of course, went underground. That was the beginning of the underground church. And the apostles remained in Jerusalem, but many of the others were scattered. Philip up in Samaria and along the Mediterranean coast at Azotus and so forth. It was the stoning of Stephen that triggered all of this. The most, re the most religious leaders were satisfied once they had run the Christians out of Jerusalem. That relieved the pressure in the minds of the Sadducees and what have you. But not Saul of Tarsus. He's still after it. His goal was to exterminate the Christians everywhere he could find them. So he's on a rampage here. I want you to be sensitive to Hebraism versus Hellenism. Okay? Hebraism, are those, that, they are sabras. Those are born in Israel. Hellenistics are still Jews, but they were born in the Greek Empire, even though they were Jewish. And uh, Zechariah says, I will stir up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece. So there's a prophetic overtone of that. And I want you to remember that Judas, Macca Ma Judas Maccabeus was against Antiochus Epiphanes. And that the, he actually, he and his five sons actually threw off the yoke of the Seleucid or the Greek Empire. And uh, so, now the Sadducees are in power, but they're really Hellenists. They're materialistic, worldly, they deny the supernatural, and so forth. And so Pharisees were the Hebraists. They strictly adhered to the law. They espoused Moses, believed in angels and resurrection, and they were the supernaturalists. And so they're more accessible in a sense in terms of their belief structure. And of course, where does Saul fit in? He's a Pharisee. But he successfully gets the authority from the Sadducees to go after these Christians. He is a product of Tarsus. That's a free Greek city. It received its uh, liberty from Mark Antony. It received the title of metropolis from Cilicia, as well as other privileges conferred by Augustus. So it's a favored city. Good universities, good schools, very powerful uh, elite there, and so on. It, the great university of its time surpassed even Athens and Alexandria. Now, that's a shock, by the way. It surpassed not only Athens, but Alexandria. Um, for in a zeal for philosophy, it derived its, civiliz its civilization, its origin from Greece, having been founded by the Argentine uh, um, colony. Now, Saul's father and mother were Hebrews. They were Pharisees, not Sadducees. In other words, they were very strict legalists, although they were raised in the Hellenistic culture. And uh, yet, they, they sent him to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel himself. He's able to make that claim. So he has the best Greek education possible, and he has the best Hebrew education possible. And he is, has an incredible aptitude, apt, apt mind, and all of that. Um, uh, anyway, so Saul is a Pharisee to the core. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, which governs not only over Jerusalem, but all of Judaism worldwide. Let's realize the Sanhedrin is a big deal here. So Acts chapter 9, verse 1, and Saul, yet breathing, and, uh, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. There again, and Saul. It's connecting with the foregoing. So this is a continuing narrative going here. Okay. Yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. What the Greek really says is breathing hard still. This is a, an expression of motivation behind his commitments. He's serious. And he went to the high priest, desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, 
whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. So he's on a rampage here. Letters. He wanted, he wanted the Sanhedrin to give him authority beyond Jerusalem. He's going to Damascus. That was the capital of Syria. That's his target. He's not going to start there. But that, that, and notice how he speaks of Christians. I think this is interesting. That if he found any of this way, that's used four times uh, here in chapter 19, twice, and in chapter 24. Speaking of Christians, they spoke of Christians as the way. Interesting. It's not a belief, it's a walk. See? Interesting. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Wow. He said, Who art thou? Lord. <laughs> and the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I am Jesus. Boy, that was his name before he was born. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Acts chapter 22 and 26 recount this very experience we're going to read about and includes a lot of details that aren't recorded here now. And uh, whom thou persecutest. Wow, can you imagine Saul hearing that? I have to believe that what would echo in his ears is this impressive presentation that Stephen had given the Sanhedrin with Saul present. That why he didn't buy it then, they're echoing in his ears right now. And uh, whom thou persecutest. This has a lot of implications because he is pointing out that Christ and his people are one. When he persecutes the church, he's persecuting the person of God. And I think he felt every throb of Stephen's pain. He was a witness to him being stoned. And he will grieve over that for the rest of his life. Whom thou persecutest. In other words, that against which you are fighting is not the zeal of mistaken fanatics. It is the march of God through history that you're fighting, man. Whoa. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Or the word actually is goads. See, Saul was sincere, fighting whom he believed was an enemy of Judaism and the law of Moses. He was zealous. I remember that um, Hal Lindsey used to point out that when he was on a college campus, he would try to find the biggest rabble rouser of the gang and lead him to Christ. Because what he wanted was another Paul. He didn't want some namby-pamby sideline spectator. He wanted a guy in the middle of the action, and he would find the biggest aggressive uh, adversary and bring him to the Lord. And when he succeeded, he had a a trophy for God. Then you got somebody that would really turn out to bear fruit for the kingdom. And I remember that he loved to go after what he called communicators. People who knew how to communicate. The only part of your genius that's relevant is that which you can communicate, I'm told. Anyway, this hints here that there was a pricking going on inside Paul. And I personally suspect that the arguments of Stephen that he was making in, that, in Acts chapter 7 are echoing in his ears as he goes again and again and again, through the whole history of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Now, Stephen's conflict was with the Hellenists, not with the Hebrews. His fight was with the Sadducees, which were the adversary of Paul's basic Pharisaical background. Saul was a member of the Sanhedrin. Saul had heard Stephen's presentation. I think that's a factor in the background here. Saul went to the Sadducean high priest for letters of authority against those who, while antagonistic to the ancient ritual of his people, nevertheless held to the spiritual verities of which he himself held. And by the way, something else we know from the text is Christ spoke to Paul in the Hebrew tongue. Saul saw as well as heard. We learn that from other passages. 
Saul never forgave himself. He says so in 1 Corinthians 59, Galatians 1.13, and I think it's echoed elsewhere too. Saul was not the first of his family to be saved, by the way. That came as a shock to me to realize that. Because in Romans 16, it says, My kinsmen, who also were in Christ before me. He makes that reference. In other words, there were some in this august family of Saul's background that had become Christians before Saul did. Yeah, that was my reaction too. Wow, exactly. Every conversion is a miracle, of course, but none greater than this one. In verse 6, he, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. He's on his way to Damascus. He's going to go into Damascus. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. The people with him heard noise. He, but Saul, we know from other accounts, actually saw. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. His eyes were opened, but he saw no man. It's a strange thing because he's blind, and we discover he has an eye problem for the rest of his life. It never apparently gets completely dealt with. We'll get on to that here in a minute. Damascus, of course, is one of the first cities that Alexander had conquered. It's one of the oldest continually inhabited cities on the planet Earth, by the way. And the word Saul, by the way, means destroyer. How appropriate. He changes it ultimately to Paul, which is the opposite. It means a builder. Saul's a destroyer. Paul is a builder. And I think that's rather interesting. But they led him by the hand. Ooh, what's going on here? It seems that he had an eyesight problem that doesn't go away. He was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So this is a guy shook up pretty bad. What did he do for those three days? He did not eat or drink. Probably a lot of thinking. He's had his whole world, his whole value system turned upside down. And that, that is an emotional shock of some substance. And he deals with that in both Philippians 3 and Galatians 2. Galatians 2.20 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. That's a Hebraism. And it is no longer I that live. That's a Hellenism. But Christ liveth in me. That's Christianity. All three of those concepts are woven there in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no, it is no longer that I live, but Christ liveth in me. That's an amalgam of Hebraism, Hellenism, climaxing in Christianity. This guy is brilliant. And we're going to get insights from him like none other. And he was three days without sight, neither did he eat or drink. Okay. This thorn in the flesh that he refers to in 2 Corinthians 12, we think, is um, something to do with his eyesight continuing. There's a hint that it's an eye problem in Galatians 4 and also in Galatians 6 and 2 Thessalonians 2. We won't spend a lot of time on that. Just be aware of the fact that he does, he does suffer from some kind of a problem he calls a thorn in the flesh. And people who are the wealth and health prophets have a problem because Saul or Paul was never healed. So the idea that you are destined to always be healed is a myth spread by false teachers. Paul is, the, is one of the many rebuttal examples of that. And we gather that he apparently never fully recovered from this Damascus Road blinding that he experienced. And it's interesting how often we see three days in the scripture. He was blind for three days, right? Abraham had Isaac dead to him for three days, we're told in uh, Hebrews 11. Uh, Joseph had uh, three-day dreams in prison. Remember those dreams that he had? Rahab's spies uh, went from Hebel to Tikva. We've talked about that in terms of, again, three days from the trauma of Golgotha through the, the exaltation of the empty tomb. Uh, we have Esther who fasted for three days. We have Jonah who was in the fish for three days. And even Jesus points to that as uh, a foreshadowing of his three days in the belly of the earth. And Christ in the tomb, of course, is pointed. And him, he himself links those two up. And uh, the nation of Israel have three days involved when they petition Jesus to come in the second coming. So these three days are things I encourage you to make a note of that. Do your own search 
and find out how many times those things seem to be used of the Lord in a very special way. But let's us move on in verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. This is not Ananias of Sapphira. He's, he's, he's been put away for a while. This is a different Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. He said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Now the street called Straight, that goes east and west between gates there. It's divided by Corinthian columns into three avenues. The center avenue is for footmen. One is for eastern traffic and one is for western traffic. So you've got a, for, a, a foreshadowing of our highways. You've got two different directions plus foot traffic in the center. Three avenues by Corinthian columns. Street call straight. Anyway, this, and this guy hath seen a vision, a na- uh, uh, in a vision, he named Ananias, Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Ananias is not excited about the assignment because he's supposed to pick up this guy who apparently is a pretty uh, uh, strong adversary. But nevertheless, he doesn't, he just, he mentions all of that, but salutes and says, okay, you know, let's get with it. And uh, you can understand, however, Ananias' uh, uh, apprehension. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Wow. This is God instructing Ananias. Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul. Wow. That's quite, it takes a lot of guts. Huh? Brother Saul. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. Okay. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Man. But we'll notice as we study Paul's writings that his eyes apparently continue to be a problem cosmetically as well as functionally. And we'll see that as we go through the rest of the the rest of the book of Acts actually. And when he had received meat he was strengthened. Then Saul then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. You can imagine how nervous they must have been. They didn't know that this wasn't some ruse of his to get them captured. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. And that must have finally, I'm sure, apprehensively at first, but they gradually, cautiously begin to realize that he is now one of them. The Son of God, that appears in John's epistle 23 times, Paul's epistles 29 times, Peter's confession of Caesarea, of course, uh, Philippi was once, the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which cough on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? They're shook up. They don't know that this might not be some kind of a trap here, see? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is very Messiah, the Christ. Man. Now, as you study your Bible, you'll discover we now have some missing years to account for that are not recorded. And there's about a three-year gap missing here, at least two years of which he goes to Arabia. That's mentioned in Galatians 1 and 1 Corinthians 15, briefly. The Sinai desert preparation was for both Moses and Elijah, and apparently Paul also. Moses and Elijah spent time in the Sinai desert, and so did Paul. So in these three years was a lot of preparation going on, okay? Probably got all this in Arabia from Jesus Christ personally. That's his claim, not from the disciples. God never uses for the great work of interpreting his kingdom any man who has not been definitely called and spiritually trained. That's a very important thing for us to stand. So 
before Paul's work, he actually had quite several years of preparation, and apparently a substantial of that was with Jesus Christ himself. He makes allusions to it, but not detailed. Jerusalem versus Antioch in Galatians 4.25. Um, Jerusalem declines, Antioch increases, and we'll see that happen. Saul returns to Damascus, escapes to Jerusalem, and then returns to his hometown, Tarsus. And so he's there quite later, because of new, a new movement in Antioch, Barnabas goes to Tarsus to find him. Barnabas needs help, and he remembers an old friend of his in Tarsus. He tracks him down and recruits him to come to Antioch. Antioch is starting to emerge to be the center of the church outreaches in the region. Jerusalem's on the decline in importance in that sense, and Antioch is on the rise. Between the Damascus Road apprehension and Jerusalem was three years. So let's continue here, verse 23. After that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying await was known of Saul. He somehow got tipped off. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. The gates were ordered uh, to be guarded by the king, by the way, you know, from 2 Corinthians 11. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by a wall by, uh, by the wall, in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him <laughs> and believed not that he was a disciple. So they didn't trust him. They were sweating that. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached bodily, excuse me, boldly uh, at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas is really his advocate here. Barnabas was the Levite, native of Cyprus. That was annexed as a Roman province off the coast of Sicilia, uh, where Saul was born. His name means the son of consolation and comfort. Indeed, he was to Saul. That's Barnabas' calling, apparently. Both of them were Hellenistic Jews and eminent in their respective localities, and he may have known him before. That's the impression we get from several reasons that they're old friends. And he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So Saul's got a no-win here. His old friends are trying to kill him, and his new friends don't trust him. Disputed is the word there. <laughs> uh, only here, in, uh, disputed with the Hellenistic Jews. Saul picks up the ministry of Stephen, the very man whose death he consented because he's against the Sadducees, and so was, so was uh, Stephen. Which, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. So a vision sends him away, we find out later on in Acts 22. And uh, he, a direct would be to sail from Caesarea north to Sidnus and then the harbor to Fort Tarsus. However, he came to the regions of Syria and Sicily and landed at Seleucia and, and proceeded by land to Antioch, then north to Sicily and uh, uh, to Tarsus. So he, he apparently went largely by land for some reason. Then had the churches rest. Can you imagine that? They'd been really beat up for a while, but they had a rest now for a while throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. So praise God for that. The churches had a rest. I like that phrase. Something to give you another glimpse here. Emperor Caligula had a persistent determination to have an image of himself set up in the temple of Jerusalem. And an influential Jewish deputation continually attempted to prevent this from happening. Petronius, who was the governor of Syria, was ordered to make war on the Jews and force them to put the image of Caligula in the temple. And they're not, that's not going to happen because that is going to be reserved for an event that Jesus used predictively. But he, Petronius was ordered. Petronius chooses to violate the order. And Caligula finds out and orders Petronius, Petronius killed. But by a strange mix-up at sea, the message of Caligula's death arrives before the order to have Petronius killed. And since Caligula dies, all orders are null and void, so he was spared. And so, but the... Uh, uh, anyway, we can get on with this. So, but for Caligula's death, the measure would have succeeded. 
This whole distraction between the Jews and Caligula over the image issue may have been part of why the church was a second priority for a while. See, while they're, the Jews are fighting with the Romans over that issue, they laid off the church for a while. So now we're going to talk a little bit about Peter's ministry. From here to chapter 12, it is Peter's ministry that will be front and center. From chapters 13 on, it'll be Paul's ministry that we call Unit 2. It came to pass, as Peter passed through all the quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydia. Lydda. And uh, Lydda is 12 miles southeast of Joppa. And Joppa, of course, is uh, uh, where Jonah caught a sh uh, ship and all that. Now, the believers there are a result, of course, of Philip's effort, we learned back there in Acts chapter 8. And when he found a certain man named Enos, uh, he, uh, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy, Peter said unto him, Enos, Jesus Christ, maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Boy, Peter seems to have the gift here. He, he, God used him to raise the lame man very early in this, in this book. And now he's raising this guy here. Um, he's not doing it. God's doing it. Don't misunderstand me. But it's interesting that he, those experiences seem to surround him. And now there's no uh, evidence that Enos was a believer. It was not his faith, Enos' faith, that made this happen. It was the Holy Spirit working through um, Peter. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. So it was a sign that God used to get many converted. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. So she had the gift of, of, of doing good for others. And uh, so Dorcas or Tabitha use either name as the same person. And Joppa, of course, is modern today. It's Jaffa. And when you stay in, in uh, Tel Aviv, it's not hard to get to, to, uh, to uh, Jaffa. It's a typical hike. If you're about 45 miles southeast of Jerusalem, it's Jonah's seaport, and it's close to Tel Aviv, so it's a, a very popular uh, walk for those that are staying there. And uh, Tabitha is Syro-Chaldaic, apparently. Dorcas is the Greek. It's a Greek term for antelope or gazelle, if you will. So both, those are both names applied to this person. And it sounds like she had the gift of helps, as 1 Corinthians 12 might list it. But it came to pass in those days when she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Leda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring that he would not delay to come to them. But understand, she's already died. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Wow. Peter did exactly what Jesus did to his mother-in-law. Christ raised from the dead only three occasions that I'm aware of. Jairus' daughter, which we've talked a lot about, the widow of Nain's son, and Lazarus. Those are three. And, uh, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called his saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. These are fabulous days. Peter's continuing the work of Christ as a member of the body, the body of Christ. It came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. We read that so casually, typically with no real grasp of what that meant. A tanner was an abhorrent profession to the Jews because it deals with continual contact with dead animals and blood, and so forth. These are all abhorrent to the Jewish mind. The law said that he had to be outside the city. Okay. Now, the first insight that Peter, to some extent, is overcoming prejudice, because that was something the Jew would not go near of Tanner. And by his very willingness to stay with the Simon Tanner, you're getting a feeling that Peter is beginning to lose this typical Jewish prejudice. 
And for a complete study of the gifts of the Spirit, see our briefing package on that subject. But let's move on here. We're going to move on with chapter 10, where Peter is going to be even more confronted with his regulations. We're going to, this is the chapter that deals with Cornelius. Remember the marching order is said to the uttermost parts of the earth. The book of Acts shifts from the Jews, that's Jerusalem and Judea, to the half-Jews, the Samaritans, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, the Gentiles. And we're about eight years after Pentecost at this point. Um, Peter, not Paul, is to be the door opener to the Gentiles. Paul will pick that up and make his primary calling, but Peter is the one that God uses to open that door. That's his way of doing things here. Had Paul been the prime move toward uncircumcised Gentiles in the church, the Jewish contingent, who were never friendly to him, could have acquired such strength to bring a disastrous schism in the church. That, I think, is part of the dynamics going on here. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band. So he is in, a, a, uh, in, one, of the, in, the, in one of the bands here. And I'll get into that a little bit here. Caesarea, this is not Caesarea Philippi. Remember I said this is on the coast, the headquarters of the Roman establishment. And Cornelius is a centurion of the Italian cohort, arriving under, uh, uh, that, serving under Herod Agrippa, a representative of the Roman power in the district. Now, we keep talking about legions. There's a lot of misconceptions here. Let me pause a little and give you the tutoring here. This term centurion doesn't really mean hundred. Nominally 100, but it's really much less than that. Rome had a total of 28 legions, a legion being about 5,500 men. Each legion had 59 centurions and consisted of 10 cohorts. Each legion is 10 cohorts. Follow me so far. Okay. The first cohort was larger than the others. It was divided into five double centuries of about 800 men total. Okay, so now cohorts 2 through 10 were six centuries each, about 80 men each. A cohort was normally about 80 men. The first cohort was, an, it was a substantially larger and for no other reason than to confuse their enemies. Now, since each legion also had about 120 horsemen or cavalry, um, the total legion was about 5,500 men. Let me diagram this for you. Maybe it'll be a little clearer. Ten cohorts actually embrace about 59 centurions. Centurions was a rank, if you will, but not necessarily of 100 men. The first cohort, cohort is unusual. It's 800 people, consisting of five double centuries. Okay. Now, cohorts 2 through 10 are six centuries each, um, each, each century being about 80, not 180. And uh, so if you take uh, Six centuries of 80 each, you got 480 men of each of those cohorts, but there's nine of them from number two through number 10. So the normal cohorts would embody 4,320 4, people. But you add the oversize of the first cohort, which is actually 800 men, and then add the 120 that are cavalry, you've accounted for 5,240. There's every other auxiliaries and other assistants and so forth. So the legions apparently were about 5,500. I don't know if that helps or confuses, but the cohorts was the basic unit, somewhat similar in infantry to a company, if you will. And, uh, but they, they confuse that up a little bit because they make the first cohort, the cohort five double centuries. And, uh, the se and so, uh, the, uh, in other words, they're not six centuries, they're five, but the centuries are double in size is the point. So those five are 800 men, if you will. Okay. I don't know if that helps. I just threw that in there. Okay. So a centurion was a rank of an officer of nominally 100, more likely less than that, like 80. And uh, it's, a, it's a rank of a person. It takes the name as if he was in charge of 100 people. Now, if you signed up, by the way, for the Roman legions, you signed up for 25 years. That was your enlistment. But at the end of that, you got citizenship, which was a big deal. And so it's a, but you signed up for a very serious obligation. And the Roman legions were highly disciplined with them. They conquered the world. And so, now chapter 8 gives you the conversion of the Ethiopian treasurer, who was a son of Ham. Chapter 9 gives you the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, which is a son of Shem. And chapter 10 gives the conversion of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, a son of Japheth. 
And I think that 8, 9, and 10, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, to me that's interesting. It sounds to me like this is a evidence of deliberate design. The three sons of Noah are represented in the three in Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So I thought you might find that provocative. Moving to, ver- uh, ver- we're now to verse 2 of, ro- of chapter 10. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave him much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He's talking about the centurion. He was a devout man. Remember, Luke tells us in his gospel that a centurion built the synagogue in Capernaum. So these centurions are always good guys in Luke's writings, it seems. He feared God in all his house, gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. He was godly, not necessarily a proselyte to Judaism. He's out, still outside the covenant. But let's remember that the centurion built the synagogue in Capernaum in Luke chapter 7. And let's move on here. Um, he, had a, 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 he saw a vision evidently in the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And this is about three in the afternoon. Get the picture. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. He said, what is it, Lord? He said to him, thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. So God heard the prayers of this centurion. His alms were accepted. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Okay, so there's two Simons here, Simon Peter and Simon the tanner. But okay, let's move on here. Joppa is about 30 miles away, south of Caesarea. Simon the tanner, again, is, I want to remind you, a tanner is despised. If a girl was betrothed to a tanner without knowing he was a tanner, the betrothal was void. <laughs> okay. And his house had to be at least 50 cubits outside the city. See, tanners were not welcome within the Jewish mind. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on, waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Okay, there's a household of three uh, that shared this trip. Declared all these things. He apparently explained to them, and they must have been devout also. So we infer that they have the same uh, perspective that Cornelius had. So these are three believers that are coming apparently. On the morrow, they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. One thing you realize when you visit Israel that very often the houses are built on hillsides, but the, the key place of the house is the roof. They make the roof like a, a place to receive guests and so forth. And the other rooms are down below. It's just the style very typical there. So, so Peter went up on the housetop, which is like the, 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 the patio, if you will, uh, to pray about the sixth hour. That's about noon. Peter must have been overcoming some of his prejudice because he's staying with a tanner. That itself puzzles people. Watch this because a Jew would do that. Uh, very, it's very unusual. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending onto him. And it had been a great sheet, um, a, a knit at the four corners, let down to the earth. And... Uh, a great sheet. Uh, that it's what you and I might call a tarpaulin, okay? Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth. This is a trance. This is a vision we're seeing here. Um, and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. That would be an anathem. This is non-kosher food. He's not, he's not excited about that. In Leviticus 11, we read about the Levitical laws of clean and unclean. These are unclean. See, what God is instructing him is that he is no longer under the Mosaic system and he is free to eat anything. That's the lesson that's going to be taught to him here. Peter said, not so, Lord. (laughs) I always think that's an oxymoron. He says, Lord, you do what he says. No, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. That's a brag, because he's a good Jew, in other words. Not so, Lord. That's what we call an oxymoron, a self-contradictory phrase. 
Yet to an observant view, to eat Levitically unclean animal is unthinkable. And we find that obviously coming on elsewhere. And the voice that spake unto him a second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done thrice. This happened three times. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Peter was probably pretty shook here. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, uh, were lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So he's being led by the Spirit. He must be pretty bewildered. He's got these wild visions, and now he's got these strangers that God somehow has sent there. And, uh, so this, and the Spirit now is talking to him. We, we read this so casually, we need to pause and realize how, what the impact must have been on him, because you don't normally hear the Spirit talking to you. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to bear words of thee. Then he called them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, when you put this all together, you're going to discover that there were uh, ten people that journeyed. Uh, two men 30 miles apart are being brought together. Ten men journeyed. Two household servants and a soldier, the apostle Peter, and we'll learn from chapter 11 that there were six Christian Jews in the party too. So there's ten men, which is the number of witness too, by the way. Ten is the number of witness in Boaz and Ruth and other places. And on the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, he called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. And Peter said, took him up and said, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Obeisance was misunderstood. That's an Eastern custom, but Peter didn't buy that. He, didn't, he, didn't, he refused to get that kind of gesture. It's a very common gesture in the East, but he wouldn't allow it. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. There's quite a group here because you've got Peter's ten and then Cornelius had a gang. Remember that a Jew is not even supposed to enter the house of a Gentile. And it's probably the first time that Peter had ever been in a Gentile house for all we know. And he said to them, Ye know how it is an it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So Peter is learning. He's picking up on all this. And he really understood the vision. He broke the code, as we might say. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and in the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither to Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon the Tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. And immediately therefore I send unto thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all the things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. That is a gigantic statement for uh, Peter to utter. We take it so for granted because we've read so much in the New Testament. This is not new news to us. But it certainly is a totally new perspective for Peter to be articulating here. And uh, the word which God had sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, 
for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. He never mentions Jesus without mentioning that the Jews uh, killed him. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. You know, it's interesting that Jesus, after his resurrection, before his ascension, is always beheld with loving eyes and always handled by loving hands. Very interesting. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Boy, there's a famous Bible verse that add, people add to their collection. P Peter here is talking to a Gentile group. He is opening the door here to the Gentiles. That's the intent of this whole uh, sequence here. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's why we have the crowd. These are to be witnesses. They're to highlight the fact that this is opening the door to the uttermost part of the earth. And uh, now his speech, Peter's speech, is going to be interrupted with a gift of praise. And there was a manifestation of the supernatural, and the Gentiles were included. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. See, baptism of water was an act of profession, not to be confused with the giving of the gifts or the baptism of the Spirit. Those are three different things. The gifts of the Spirit are detailed for you. I encourage you, this is a very basic study. You need to go at it very carefully. There are three chapters in 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, 13, and 14, that are the whole story. Chapter 12 is the... Uh, uh, talks about the gifts. Not everyone receives the same gift. People who say that it has to be the gift of tongues are not biblical. Not everyone receives the same gift. The Holy Spirit gives them severally as he wills. They're diverse. They're different. It's, he's sovereign in this area. The body consists of a variety of members, and that means we have a variety of gifts. And if you have a gift of the Spirit and you're not exercising it, you're defrauding the body of one of its members. Okay, so that's a quick summary of chapter 12. Your gift that God gives you is your key to what your calling is. I usually ask the audience how many are saved, and all the hands go up, and I say, why? Why has God saved you? There's a collective reason, sure, I buy that, but there's also a specific reason. Every one of us in this room, everyone in the sound of this voice, if you're saved, God has a calling for you. And the great adventure in life is to discover what that calling is. And your key to that is what gift God has given you, what supernatural gift you have. Your gift is the key to your calling. And Romans 12 deals with that in the, in the first half a dozen chapter, verses in that chapter. Now, that's the installation chapter. When you jump to 1 Corinthians 14, you have the cautions about abuse in here. Speaking in unknown tongues. No two spiritual gifts are the same. I want to emphasize that. But as you have the installation of this in chapter 12 and some of the cautions that are expressed in chapter 14, right between these two chapters, Paul says, I show you a more excellent way. In other words, the Corinthian church has gotten carried away with the gifts of the Spirit, if that's possible. They certainly were. Because I'll show you something far more important. And that's where you get this magnificent expression in 1 Corinthians 13 where he says, Though I have to speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have nothing. And you have this incredible tour de force on love as a better way. The rebuttal to the tongues, both 
at both ends, ahead of this and behind us, is 1 Corinthians 13. In there, in verse 10, it says that when that which is perfect has come, then the gifts will be done away with. But the what is perfect has come is referring to Jesus Christ. He's the only thing that's perfect. Some people try to make that mean something else, and I don't believe they're correct. We do know that these gifts are permanent without repentance. And so if you abuse those, you may be taken out of the ball game. Ananias and Sapphira were taken out of the ball game for other reasons, but I think that also happens to people who might be abusing a gift of the Holy Spirit. Be careful with that. Romans 11, 29 deals with that. No gift is to be put above another. I'm always reminded, my friend Walter Martin, who's probably the greatest living expert on comparative religions when he was alive, died some years ago. I was on his board. He's a good friend. But Walter, when he was very young, had an unusual experience in New Guinea. There apparently was a very well-documented case where someone was raised from the dead and made the papers and so forth. And uh, so Walter used to trade on that occasionally. Uh, he had, Walter, by the way, privately did speak in tongues, but he didn't advertise that because so many people abuse that whole concept. But when he encountered it, uh, people who, are, who believe in the gifts are called charismatics. Within that group, there's a subgroup that we generally call Pentecostals who insist that speaking in tongues is the important one, the main one, the, and they, they, they insist on that. Walter, when he encountered one of those, would um, uh, say, uh, get into discussion and say, well, do you have the gift of raising from the dead? And the guy said, well, well, no, I haven't. And Walter would look crestfallen. Oh, well, I'll pray for you so that you might enter into that gift. And it took the guy a little r to realize he was deliberately being facetious or sarcastic, depending on how you want to look at it. And what he was trying to do is dramatize that no one gift is above another. And he just used that to feed his adversary some of the arguments that they sometimes use that imply, if not, if not overtly expressed, they imply that the gift of tongues is somehow the badge of really having entered in. And that is not scriptural. And uh, so there's abuses here. There are abuses in the sense that people say the gifts are not for today. They happen to be biblically incorrect. There are others that say that one gift is above another and they are also not biblically correct. And uh, there are, are there, you know, the, the others uh, that, uh, that take these things too far. So uh, it's important that we, we really study these three chapters, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, because they really, they're not, there's a lot much more on the spiritual gifts, but those three chapters are certainly the cornerstone of this holy. The gifts are for today. Our Lord announces them in John 14 through chapter 17, the upper room discourse. And they're without termination. He would have said so. There's no doctrine to be built upon the completion of the canon because the canon technically isn't complete yet. Some people say when that which is perfect has come is a reference to the canon. There's no way. Canon is not complete. The seven thunders haven't uttered their voices in it yet. And I'm not being facetious. There's a number of rebuttals to that view. Peter's quoting Joel is one of the best because Joel talks about the, the gift of the Spirit as having started there, what Peter says, it started, that Joel talked about. Well, what Joel's talking about is what's enduring to the end. There's no termination of that. And that's a, a theological argument often overlooked. And, uh, and going further, one valid example of the sign gifts destroys any expositional rebuttals. That proves that they're, not, they are, you know, they're still current going, in other words. So I suggest reading for those that are troubled by this, to read a book called Charismania, Fact or Fiction, by none other than Chuck Smith himself. Excellent little book. Really nails it. Here's a guy that is, is really, in very real terms, balanced on this area. And uh, for a complete study of the gifts, you can see our briefing package called The Spiritual Gifts, or just check our exp expositional commentary on 1 Corinthians. Which leads me to ask some questions. Are we a contradiction? Are we tr do we have trials without triumph? Do we have battles without victory? Do we have service without success? Do we have movement without progress? Do we have profession without experience? Do we have life without health? 
union without communion? See, where are we? Are we on the correct side of the resurrection, but on the wrong side of Pentecost? Are we on the correct side of pardon, but on the wrong side of power? Are we justified, but not yet sanctified? Absolutely. Well, I leave that with you, because the, the exercise of the gifts may be a key thing in your life. And as you probably notice, as we go through the book of Acts, we don't play favorites. We have something to offend everyone. So we you hope you find these at least provocative. In our next session, we're going to wrap up Unit 1 by finishing up with two chapters. Chapter 11 and chapter 12, which will be more of Peter's ministry to the Gentiles. And we're going to talk about uh, the Antioch rising to power and so forth. Setting the stage for the next unit, which is focused from beginning to end on this phenomenal character by the name of Paul. But among other things within the unit two that you really want to focus on is chapter 15, the Council for Jerusalem. Because that really has implications for us today in some very practical and profound ways. And so with that, I suggest we have a closing word of prayer.